Working It Out, a podcast show about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplaces, our communities, and our lives. A show where we put diversity and inclusion to work. Got problems on the job. We're working it out. With that workplace got you stressing. We're working it out. With that yeah, we're working it out, working it out, working it out. Welcome. I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver, your host of Working It Out. On this episode, we're going to talk about the hybrid workplace culture. And I'm so excited because I'm joined by Stasha Connor, founder of Virtual Work Insider. She is a renowned virtual work expert, i.e. advocate. And what we love about her is that she gives specific tips and strategies to help companies and individuals like yourself and me to navigate their remote workplace culture. Sasha helps leaders as they strive to maintain a strong culture and help people figure out how to be connected and engaged in hybrid and remote companies. Sasha started working virtually well before the pandemic. So just in case you thought she became an overnight sensation, she spent years really cultivating and understanding what it takes to make hybrid workplaces effective. In fact, she has been learning and strategizing ever since her former employer, Clorox, approved her to move from California across the country to Pennsylvania. And then her employer said, Sasha, make this work. So we're lucky to benefit from her presence and expertise today. Welcome, Sasha. Hi, Dr. Weaver. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, before we get into the details of your wisdom, it's important to, for, for me to remember and also for our audience that according to the 2021 American Community Survey, they estimated that between 2019 and 2021, the number of people working primarily from home tripled from around 9 million, which was about 5.7%, to over to 28 million, which is like 18%. Can you imagine that increase in a two-year span? And obviously, we know that was because that was caused by the pandemic uh, in terms of that growth. Um, so anyway, before the pandemic, though, the truth of the matter is that many organizations were trying to increase workplace flexibility by allowing their workers to flex their jobs and work from home. So we're going to discuss these issues and more about the new hybrid workplace culture with you. Sasha, the first thing I want to find out from you is since you were a remote worker well before the pandemic, what difference did the pandemic have on workplace culture? Yeah, so I just celebrated my 12-year remote anniversary. So that's 12 years oh. of working remotely while leading hybrid and remote teams. And as you started to allude to, you know, my remote work story started in 2010. So that's when I was working for Clorox, that $7 billion company that's headquartered in Oakland, California. And I've been working from that headquarters location for six years when my husband and I had our first child. Her name is Nevin, and she was born while we were living in San Francisco, but my family and my husband's family live here in the Philly area, and we wanted her to grow up near her grandparents. Uh -huh. So that prompted me to ask a bold question to Clorox, which was, could I keep my job but do it from the opposite coast of the United States? And in 2010, it was unheard of at the time to have a job like I did, which was leading large new product innovation teams, sales teams, and marketing teams, and not be at headquarters. But I had a good relationship with the chief marketing officer, and he said, okay, you can be an experiment. So let's see if you can do your job from 3,000 miles and three time zones away. But in those early years of remote work, things were really different. So me as a fully remote worker, I was in such a small minority. So you just, you, you mentioned a stat earlier around uh, it being less than 6% of fully right. remote workers back in 2019. Well, if you think back to 2010, it was even less than that. Yeah, and yeah. so back in, in that stage, the onus of, of being included when you were remote was completely on the shoulders of the people that were fully remote like me. So it was completely on my shoulders to make sure that I was included, that I felt like I belonged. So let me give you an example of that. 
So I back in 2010, I would have to review my calendar several days in advance at, for all of my meetings and then reach out to the meeting host and say, can you please put a dial-in number in the invite? Because otherwise I'm not going to be able to participate. So it could be because it was always the default of the people um, to think about the people that were co-located in the building, not the default to think about those of us that were across distance. So with the move to the pandemic, what I what I saw happen was this incredible empathy exercise where now everyone was having to work fully remotely and think about how to connect with each other across distance. And now as, as offices are reopening and most are moving into a hybrid environment, it's getting even more harder and, and more complex. Mm -hmm. And even then you didn't have the technologies like what we have now, did they have Zoom? Oh, no, so Zoom, Zoom wasn't even a thing yet. So actually, yeah. what's funny is when I when I first went remote, everything was dialed in by phone. Yeah, so Clorox started to work with WebEx or with Cisco. I don't think it was even called WebEx then. Mm -hmm. And I became best friends with the IT group, and I became this this experiment where they would give me these IP addresses with a bunch of like numbers and dots. And I would put that into Cisco. It was called movie. And I could just show up on any screen in any conference room. <laughs> oh my goodness. So that I could start to feel connected using the video. But yes, today we have so many more technology tools to stay connected. Well Sasha, we know now that there's an interest, even I would say a demand uh, for workers to be able to work remotely. And we know it's not going away. And I'm not sure we'll ever fully be in the office five days a week again. So how has that impacted most workplaces? I mean, how do how does the workplaces create their culture when everybody's everywhere and not always in the same place at the same time? Yeah, so I get this question a lot about culture. And I always like to start by defining what do we mean by culture, because oftentimes people conflate culture with happy hours and foosball tables. So mm -hmm. culture is not one more happy hour, right? Happy hours help with camaraderie building, which is the mutual trust and friendship among people who spend a lot of time together. It's an important part of culture, but culture is a much bigger concept. So it's the, the values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that are shared by a team. It's how people work together toward a common goal, and it's how they treat each other. And that's really hard to do when you are working in hybrid teams because you're behind these kind of virtual curtains where, you know, usually those values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, they are picked up on organically when we're in an office setting co-located together. That's how we see how people work together and how they treat each other. But when we're working across distance, the small peaks behind those, those curtains that we get, that's in our, our meetings, that's in our digital communication. So we need to be really intentional about spelling out the type of culture that we want to build. And I can give you an example of that. I would love to. I was going to ask you that. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, so when we work with companies, we will look at the company values. We start with the values and then we'll actually ladder them down to specific and observable behaviors mm -hmm. that uh, teams and employees should be demonstrating. And most of the companies that we work with have some sort of articulated value around DE&I, for example. But then I push them to think through that, that location inclusive lens. How are they going to set an expectation for their teams to ensure that people feel like they are valued and that they belong regardless of where they live or work from on any given day? Mm -hmm. So here's a really specific example for you. So one of our clients, um, their company value, one of the values is we stand for equality and we don't sit on the sidelines. We speak up for fairness and equity. And so if we look at that value through a location inclusive lens, a really specific behavior that you could point to is something like live meetings are designed in a way to enable everyone to feel heard and valued regardless of location. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to teach people how to, the tactical piece of this, like how to facilitate meetings that actually allow people to be heard and, and feel like they're part of the discussion, whether they're in the group that's co-located together in an office conference room, or if they're, if they're calling in virtually or remotely. So is that like a separate training exercise you take them through? 
Yeah, so we have a workshop that is specifically about how to lead more effective, inclusive, and engaging virtual meetings. And we, we teach things like a technique that, you know, if you're in a hybrid meeting where you have some people in, in different conference rooms and other people remote, that everyone still logs into the, the Zoom link or the Microsoft Teams link. So everybody has equal access to the chat function, to the raising of the virtual hands. We'll even have them put, everybody put their, their video on on their laptops. Again, so everybody has equal um, equal real estate on, on the screen so that, that um, people feel more connected versus just seeing a conference room where people are really tiny um, when when you are looking at the room remotely. You know, I was going to sneak in that, that question about what happens when you have some people that don't want to come on the screen. Yes, um, that comes up a lot, right? So I think being comfortable on camera is really difficult. So I've had years and years of training um, mm -hmm. to get comfortable on camera. I am a huge introvert and I hated it at first. I hated being on the screen. Sometimes in the Clorox conference rooms, I was the size of a large wall <laughs> and it made me really uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, but what I realized was that if I didn't have my camera on, it was really hard for me to influence. And so, so it's like if you were invited to a meeting, you would go to the meeting room. You wouldn't take a seat in a meeting room like down the hall, right? Yeah. So you want to have your your camera on to uh, enable you to have that presence. And it also, you know, helps other people read your expressions. Um, and then if you have your camera on, others are likely to have their camera on too, um, so that you can actually read the room and those micro expressions a little bit easier. That said, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So I think it's important to have conversations with your team about what meetings where it's important to have your camera on and then what meetings could be audio only. Okay, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. And what was interesting is as you shared those examples, it was clear that you help people understand why, it's, why it is in their self-interest to be on camera. You know, so right. it's not just right. a, a dictate by the manager, the supervisor, either the even the team, but it makes it works for them. So thank you for sharing those. So you know, you talked about this training that you do, and and it really leads to the to my next question, and that was the the question that you consider yourself a location inclusion advocate, more so than a remote work expert. So can you give us some perspective on that? Yeah, so I think it's important to talk about the work I do as a location inclusive advocate and not a remote work advocate, because my goal is to teach leaders and their teams how to communicate and collaborate and build culture and influence across distance, whatever distance means for that company's situation. So that could mean working from office site to office site. That could mean working in a hybrid situation where you have some people coming into an office and some people remote on any given day. You know, each company needs to decide based on their company values, the type of work that they do, their employee needs. They use that information to decide what their workforce and workplace strategy is. And these are really complex decisions. Mm -hmm. And why I say I'm not a remote work advocate is that I'm not here to judge my clients on whether or not they are enabling enough remote work for their industry, for their employees, because they have to take into consideration so many different factors. What I'm here to do is to say, you know, whatever your workforce strategy is that you decided, more than likely your teams are working across some sort of distance. And I'm here to help provide those skills and strategies to make sure it's a really location inclusive environment where you can be really effective and collaborative. Well, that this is great because, and what's really what's nice about it is that organizations, companies are investing and really uh, getting your advice and your expertise to help them do this better. You know, because sometimes in the beginning, I think many, many organizations, and I could say even ours kind of, tried to have to figure it out. You know, we had to right. kind of learn how to make it work and, and what are the rules and the new norms and how do you how do you deal with those unspoken norms and rules that typically happen in organizations? So it was just a lot of time figuring it out. And I'm just so glad that we have experts like you, advocates like you that can help us sort through it. Well, what's interesting is when you talked about these different organizations and understanding what their value sets are, Obviously, that's diversity. I mean, you you encounter a lot of diversity with these different groups. So as we think about the term diversity, equity, and inclusion, how what's your connection to that and the work that you do? I mean, how does DEI play out or does it play out 
in the in the in the inclusion location inclusion advocacy that you provide organizations mm -hmm. Well, I actually got my start with helping teens to work across this distance while I was at Clorox when I co-founded the very first virtual workforce ERG. So oh. basically we took this idea, the traditional idea of ERGs mm -hmm. and applied it to the virtual workforce. And at first I thought we were creating a, a group for this small percentage of fully remote workers at Clorox uh, to, to, to be able to share with each other, you know, how, how are you doing this when, when you're working remotely and, and to, to feel like we had a community. Um, but then what was happening was it, it started to evolve into the largest and fastest growing employee resource group at Clorox. And really? people were starting to join that were working out of headquarters and our regional offices. And I would say to them, why are you joining? This is for remote people. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, um, we want to learn how to work in our virtual teams, because even though we work at headquarters, we're working with other office sites. So even the tech center for Clorox is, is a 30 minute drive away from headquarters. That's a virtual relationship. And mm -hmm. so that's when this huge light bulb went off for me, which was everything I was learning to do fully remotely was applicable to 95% of, of the Clorox workforce because they were all working across distance. And so as, as that relates to, you know, the work that I do right now and, and how it links in with DEI is I'm often brought in to speak to organizations uh, through the, the chief diversity officer or even head of learning and development mm -hmm. so that I can shed the light on some common unconscious biases that happen in these hybrid and remote environments. So the first one is distance bias, also known as proximity bias, which is our brain's natural tendency to put more importance on the people and things that are closer to us than those that are farther away. So that, that's part of the Neuro Leadership Institute's unconscious bias model, the SEEDS model. Mm -hmm. And then there, there's its close cousin, which is recency bias, which is our brain's natural tendency to put more value on the people and things that we've seen or heard from more recently. And so it, when you become aware of those unconscious biases, then you have to start thinking about what are some tactics to mitigate those biases and shift toward more location inclusion, which I know that you have some interest in a bit to talk, talk about what some of those tactics are. Oh, that's, that's interesting because typically when, when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, people think of it as race and gender and sexual orientation and age as some of the common factors, but really you're talking about a whole nother lens by which we need to become even more conscious about and aware about. We, that's that distance bias and regency bias. So thank you so much for that. Well, you know, one of the, um, I read this article very recently and, and I know that you're aware of it. And there was some work that was done by McKinsey. And it, it struck me in this, in this article, they talked about how young workers, that are planning to enter into the work world in the near future, worry about this whole notion of loneliness. That to them, uh, making establishing connections at work, having work friends is important. Yet some of the stories we hear is that most people don't really want to work, go back to the office. And so it's almost like it's a it's contraindicated, right? But and so I'd like to get your perspective on that. I mean, how do you? How, how would you recommend to young workers uh, to think about or to engage in the behavior, as you often have said today, around nurturing relationships in a hybrid or a fully remote workplace? What would you tell them to do since we the data show that this is important to them? Yes, yeah, so I was recently reflecting on this about when I was starting at Clorox. I was in my early 20s and I was in the most junior marketing role that you can be in at the company. Uh, but that is where I built my deepest work relationships. And to, to kind of add some more color to that, you know, the um, the Oakland, California headquarters, it was 24 floors. And my closest friendships was the crew of colleagues that were on the 19th floor. So it was like so based on proximity, right? It was the people that I was sitting next to all day and sometimes all night, depending on the workload. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but then when I, I went remote back in 2010, I had to start learning how to build those relationships across distance. You know, these are real long distance relationships. 
Um, so one of the resources that came out recently that I'll point people to is there was a podcast that was done by Dropbox about building friendships in, in a remote and hybrid environment. And they had a guest on um, Dr. Marissa Franco. Uh, she's a friendship researcher. And she described the ingredients of friendship as continuous, unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. Mm. And if we peel apart that first one, that continuous unplanned interaction, that includes all those moments that we would bump into each other in an office setting, right? On the way to the bathroom, at the water cooler, in the elevator. Lunchroom. Yeah, in the lunchroom, right? And those moments, I didn't realize how important those moments were for developing friendships. Mm-hmm. And, and it's because there's something called the mere exposure effect. The more we're exposed to each other, the more familiar we become to each other, then the more likely we are to like another person and then for them to like us back, right? So that means that we need to intentionally create these repeated interactions over time. And so my team and I actually teach some techniques for how to create those small and repeated interactions. So here's here's a couple of examples on how to do this even across distance. Uh, so you could, for example, put a, a weekly or even daily reminder on your calendar to reach out to one person digitally in your, in your network. So this could be about strengthening an existing relationship or creating a new relationship. So some things to think about when you when you're um, when you're reaching out across that distance, you know, it could be the form of just a quick direct message in Slack or Microsoft Teams, just saying hello, sharing something that you you did over the weekend, right? These small little moments and interactions matter. Um, or it could be something that we teach about called a video mail, where you actually record yourself uh, talking about something that's important to you or sharing an idea that you have and sending that video. So that allows the person to watch it asynchronously whenever they're able to, to view that video. Oh, wow. And do people actually practice that? You know, because it's one thing to say these are things you do. Are you finding people really trying it out and doing it? Yeah. So when we teach our, our workshops, we give a lot of different tactics, a toolbox of tactics, really, so that you can pick the thing that is most comfortable to, for you to try. And so this is all about little behavior shifts. So yes, I've, I've had people who absolutely use that technique of putting that reminder on their calendar uh, to then um, figure out how they want to best interact with other people across distance. Some people will say, I will never do a video mail because I don't feel comfortable speaking on camera, right? So so for them, that technique is, is not a good choice, or they need to do some practicing in a really um, kind of safe environment to be able to get to the point where they feel comfortable with it. Well, I love it. And it's, it's one that I'm going to adopt if, if you give me permission to do so. I think oh, of course. It's a great yeah. idea. Um, thank you for sharing those tips. And in fact, if, if you like, we could put some of those tips on our website with the uh, with your contact information so folks can connect with you directly about that, because I just... I think it's it's so practical what you're sharing. And we did a session a couple of weeks ago with um, in one of the Fortune 50 companies. And it was it was the participants were women who were uh, perceived or uh, perceived as high potential Mm -hmm. with the ability to move in the organization. And this company is struggling with this whole hybrid versus, hey, we really want to have everybody back. But that's not going to happen because our employees have kind of rebelled against that idea. And so the women were were struggling with, well, what are some of the things that we can do to be more connected without it feeling like it's a lot more work on us? Because we still have the demands of working in this hybrid work. And on top of that, now we got children who are at home or additional things that we have to deal with while we're at home. So what are some techniques that we could use that would allow for us to build this network to be more connected without being a real long or real intense uh, expense of time. So your examples are great. And if there's an article or or something that we can convey to our listeners, please give it to us so we can can share that with them because this is absolutely great ideas. Sure. Well, me, well you know, it's, it's amazing because I want to talk to you and ask you about what does the future look like? And it was so clear to me as I listened to you, the future is now. But as you think about this, this evolution of the hybrid um, work environment, what do companies need to consider going forward in closing that culture divide, particularly 
with those workers who have to come to work. You know, they have no option. Like we do a lot of work with in my company alignment strategies with frontline employees. You know, those are your utility workers or your policemen, your 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 people in the hospital. They don't have the option to work remotely. And we we've, we've noticed that uh, there's developing kind of a slight schism between those people that have to come to work all the time versus those that they feel have the luxury to work remote, you know, hybrid. So what are you telling companies to consider doing to, to, to not let that be um, a cultural distinction that becomes a problem? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things there to unpack. You know, the first thing about the frontline workers who are required to go in because the, the job that they do requires some sort of kind of physical piece to it or meeting right. people in person. Right. And, you know, the companies that are, are working through that, I think, are thinking through what kind of flexibility can they provide to those frontline workers that may not be remote work, but some other type of perk or flexibility um, to, to be able to give them um, also some benefits, right? So, so that can kind of bring together um, those employees that get some more location flexibility, but the frontline workers who might get some other type of flexibility to give them some value. So there's that piece of it. Well, let me ask you, what kind of benefits sure. are they considering? So for example, um, more flexibility in time. So maybe you would have um, greater choice in time of your shift or when you when you need to be in, in um, the location where you need to work from. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Um, or allowing them some location flexibility by, for example, if um, you're a frontline worker, but you're expected to do a, a certain amount of training for your own upskilling every quarter um, to allow people to do that training from home. So it, it also gives them a remote work uh, okay. piece to the work that they do. Well, those are some great examples. So that, that's, that's the one side. And then there's the other side about how do we make sure that um, even though it, it seems like it's this benefit um, to, um, to allow um, people to work remotely, either fully remotely or, or in a hybrid environment, but it comes with a problem of that distance bias and recency bias that we talked about before that can really be an impact to somebody's um, career progression. And so as, as you, the question you asked about kind of what's the most important advice, like as we think about this cultural divide moving forward, mm -hmm. you know, to create that real location inclusive culture, we need to provide equal access. So equal access to information, to people, to opportunities, regardless of where people live and work from. That headquarters office site can't be that center of gravity for the organization any, any longer. Um, well, and I, Go ahead. I was just going to say that's important because equal access has been one of the big challenges when everybody was working together, you know, in an organization. How do you how do you provide that equal access? So now that we need to even reframe that differently, given this hybrid workplace we're in, the yeah. issue still remains. And, and the, the part about my story that we didn't talk about earlier is that when I moved to Philadelphia back in 2010, mm -hmm. it, it actually came with some caveats. So I was told I would never get promoted because to be director level or above, you had to be at headquarters. I was told I'd never get to work on some roles or on some businesses because those roles were too important to not be at headquarters. And I was told that I was going to move from high potential to low potential, not because my skills had changed, but because we had uncovered that there was distance bias in the people process where the, 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 the potential was linked to promotability and the promotability was linked to location. And so I took that on as a challenge to, to have them rethink that. And it took years, but I got them to delink potential from location. I got them to uh, allow me to be promoted to director and to be in those roles that they said I could never do. And so as, as we think about these, co these companies moving forward is to really to have an eye on some of their people processes to see if that distance ba bias is baked into those processes mm -hmm. and where should they start to con uh, consider or, uh, mitigating it. So HR has a real important role in this to play. Right, right. If you're in HR, if you're a functional business leader, to take a look at your calibration process, to look at your succession planning, uh, to, to see if there are some um, 
the, so, some changes in the distribution by location or by hybrid work work or remote work schedule, um, depending on you know, what that what that performance management process is or or your succession planning. Well, well, Sasha, you know we've run out of time, and I, I think I definitely would like for us to have a even an expanded conversation because your tips are so practical and so important. So, Sasha, thank you for being the founder of the Virtual Work Insider. That's how folks can get to Sasha. And I want to thank you for sharing the important information with us today. You are just, you know, you just have a, a tremendous source of ideas and practical approaches and solutions. And so I very much appreciate you sharing those so freely as you did today. I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver. And so on behalf of the Working It Out podcast crew, I wish you a safe, productive, and what we call Be Happy Week. Goodbye. Working It Out is brought to you by Alignment Strategies, a management consultancy with more than three decades of experience in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and organizational development. To learn more, visit alignmentstrategies.com. Got problems on the job. We're working it out with that workplace got you stressing. We're working it out with that. Yeah, we're working it out, working it out, working it out.